is here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I purposely didn't post stuff over the holiday weekend regarding this budget and the, and the debt and the debt ceiling and so forth, because I hadn't read it yet. But even more than that, Twitter and so forth, it's just not the right place to have a discussion about this. I'm not, despite the fact that I post, I'm not one of these social media warriors. I watch people who are in their 30s and their 20s. They have these damn iPhones on 100% of the time. And what I was doing this weekend was finishing my, the edits on my project which I think is more important than constant Twittering because 10 days from now, you're not even going to know what anybody said. So I took a lot of time today going over this. And what you're hearing is a lot of superficiality in many respects. I read the Heritage Foundation objections. I think the president of Heritage Foundation is a terrific guy. I've never met him. I've never spoken to him. But it wasn't particularly persuasive I heard what or read what the New York Post wrote in favor of the deal I didn't think that was particularly persuasive I read what our friends at the Washington Examiner wrote I didn't find that particularly persuasive in favor of it I watched this guy Dan Bishop on the steps of the Capitol he certainly wasn't very persuasive. He didn't say anything other than grouse. Stephen Moore, somebody I respect a lot. He supports it. Duke Gingrich, I guess he's a sellout and a liberal too. He supports it. But none of that matters to me. None of it. I don't care who supports it and who opposes it. Just like you, we have to make up our own minds. It's not good enough anymore to say so-and-so opposes it, so I oppose it. So-and-so supports it, so I support it. I want to read something to you. From 2015, an entire book on the debt, Plunder and Deceit. My book. On the debt, chapter 2. George Mason University economics professor Dr. Walter Williams rightly describes the underlying pathology driving the nation to economic and financial ruin as a moral problem. He said, we've become an immoral people, demanding that Congress forcibly use one American to serve the purposes of another. Deficits and runaway national debt are merely symptoms of that real problem. 
Williams stated that nearly 75% of today's federal spending can be described as Congress taking the earnings of one American to give to another through thousands of handout programs such as farm subsidies, business bailouts, and welfare. Dr. Thomas Sowell, senior fellow at the Hoover Institute. He said there was a time when the purpose of taxes was to pay the inevitable cost of government. To the political left, however, taxes have long been seen as a way to redistribute income and to finance other social experiments based on liberal ideology. And I added the consequences of the rising generation, meaning the one behind us, the consequences for them and future generations of this immoral, politically expedient, and economically ruinous behavior and policies are unambiguous, as evidenced by statistic after statistic, which are mainly ignored, discounted, or excused by most of the media, academia, and, of course, governing statists. Now... I want to read something to you that came out earlier this month. I haven't seen a single so-called conservative columnist even talk about it, let alone write about it. And this will be in my new book, because I went through it quite extensively, but it's not what the whole thing is about. The Government Accountability Office is probably the best office in the government. It has the role of looking at the finances of the country. And you may not know this, but about three weeks ago it released the nation's fiscal health roadmap needed to address projected unsustainable debt levels. Not a single one of those conservatives in the House who oppose this have even mentioned this. Not a single one of those conservatives prior to this deal even talked about it, even wrote about it. And yet I got to keep hearing them go on and on and on. That's the problem with Washington. Here's the facts from them. Ready? And bureaucrats don't normally talk like this. The federal government faces an unsustainable fiscal future. That's the first sentence. If policies don't change, debt will continue to grow faster than the economy. Our review of the nation's fiscal health found, one, large annual budget deficits drive debt growth as the government borrows to finance spending that exceeds revenue. Two, interest costs rise and make up a larger share of total spending as overall debt and interest rates increase over the long term. Three, risks include delays in raising or suspending the debt limit and events such as natural disasters. The federal government faces an unsustainable long-term fiscal future. At the end of fiscal year 2022, now that would be September 30th of last year, debt held by the public was about 97% of gross domestic product. Projections from the Office of Management and Budget and the CBO and GAO all show that current fiscal policy is unsustainable over the long term. Debt held by the public is projected to grow at a faster pace than the size of the economy. And they talk about, by 2051, by 2051, the size of the economy will be twice, excuse me, the size of the government will be twice the size of the economy. Now think about that. Increasingly large deficits, they say, drive unsustainable debt levels. Unsustainable debt levels. Now, this is dire. That's the government. The government watchdog. So what does this deal do? What does this deal do? Putting aside names and people lobbying me and writing me or going on TV, beating their chests. First, let's start with some political reality. There are some people who would never support anything 
one guy who voted against even the proposal that the Republicans put on the table says, I could never support this. He never supports anything. So it's difficult when you have, what, a five-member majority or so, give or take, in the House of Representatives to accommodate somebody like that. Number two, McCarthy's working with a very, very thin majority, as I said. And I would guess about a half a dozen of them were prepared to vote down anything. And it's very unlikely that Biden, that Biden would simply sign off on what the Republicans passed because that would endanger his presidency and drive his party further, further nuts than it is. Number three, it's strange how silent Mitch McConnell is about all of this and the Senate Republicans generally other than the conservatives. Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, a handful of others. But where is the Republican leadership in the Senate? Why are they sitting back and waiting for other people to carry, to carry the load? In fact, they don't tell us what it is that they would or wouldn't accept. Not that it would matter to me or you, but why don't they? So it's left to the House. The Senate Republicans are AWOL, 100%. Now, when you hear or read what they say they've accomplished, it sounds pretty good. The problem is, it's not good enough. I'm not going to sit here and go through my notes with you on some of the traps and some of the loopholes that are in this. Kevin McCarthy is not somebody who wants to go along with Biden or wants to support what's taking place in this country. I don't know why anybody wants to be Speaker these days. And what's interesting is the 20 or so original opponents of McCarthy, they couldn't cobble again t- together 21 people to vote for anybody. So they all pat themselves on the back for moving McCarthy to the right. Apparently, by their own definition, they didn't move him far enough. But they had no candidate. None. I happen to think he's an earnest man. So the people who trashed him before are trashing him again. Yet last week, they thought he was doing a great job. I asked a couple of these people who were of the 20 before last week. What did they tell you on this show? They think he's doing a great job. But this proposal doesn't go far enough. It simply doesn't. You have a two-year debt cap that is raised by $4 trillion dollars. $4 $4 trillion. And part of the problem for McCarthy and for Biden is that some of the Biden people are going around telling everybody how they intend to get around caps and other provisions that will have been agreed to. And so Biden and the Democrats are not negotiating in a way that's reliable. They're already telling us what they're going to do. Now, we can hold out. By my calculation, I took a sharp pencil to all this, the amount of money that comes into the federal government, certain things that are to be paid that have nothing to do with general operating expenses, and yet they really do, because they destroyed the trust funds for Social Security and Medicare, so... Basically, that comes out of general revenue, even though it's not supposed to. But they play this game that it's not. So let's put that aside. By statute, those programs are to continue to pay. 
So what you really have here, and the big lie you've been hearing is that we don't, is a several-month period where the government can continue to function. And as time goes on, they have to reprioritize what they're going to spend their money on. And the president can do that. He doesn't want to do that. And in the Democrats, you're dealing with kamikazes. You're dealing with people who would be perfectly happy to see this country collapse. So my own view is, more time should have been taken, and can still be taken, to get even a better deal. It may not be the deal that some who claim to be conservative would want. But I suspect it could be better. And therefore, I'm not voting. But I think they ought to take another look at this. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fall out could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, Call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. See, the reason you need to think about this, independent of everybody else, what this proposal does, despite what some of the kamikazes have to say, and I'll deal with them in a minute, it cuts some spending, just not enough. I don't know of any budget in my lifetime that cut one nickel from spending. They'll bring up Boehner. Boehner? Boehner was a disaster. But in the last 10 years, I looked at this, there really hasn't been any. And there are efforts to cap spending when they don't have an agreement to 99%, which is effectively a 1% cut. So there are, there are earnest efforts here that ought not be attacked to try and do something about this budget given the fact that you got a five vote majority or whatever it is in the house no support in the senate and a nut job in the in the oval office it just doesn't go far enough now i know you guys are worried federal reserve staff said banking crises full out could push the economy into recession this year but you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. 
If you're trying to reach Mark on the air, call him at 877-381-3811. The Mark Levin Radio Show continues. You know, as I watch this unfold, people going on television, and you're out there probably confused as hell because everybody sounds like they know what they're talking about. Except this guy, the bishop, he sounded like an idiot. But nonetheless, when you hear Chip Roy, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. Chip's a dear friend of mine. When you hear some of these other people, they make a lot of sense too. But the numbers are the numbers. And here's something you and I have always known. Washington will never and ultimately can never fix Washington. Even conservatives who live and work in Washington, D.C., or maybe they used to and now they've moved somewhere else, they believe Washington can fix Washington. I believe that's going to be very tough. It's very tough to do. You can have an impact, there's no question about it. But the reason why I support Convention of States, because I'm convinced that the only way to fundamentally alter the trajectory of this country is not watching TV and listening to the politicians or reading columns and by all those who claim to be expert, it's all the rest of it. It's by taking the power out of Washington. And we're already organized to fight this. And we have been for several years now through Convention of States. And what we're going to do here is keep a list of every single member who votes against this proposal. And I'm going to ask Mark Meckler, the big muckety-muck at Convention of States, to tell us how many of those members have been actively involved in Convention of States. I don't mean issued a statement saying they're supporting it. How many of them have been actively involved in it? Because that's the real pushback. It's not Kevin McCarthy. Or any other speaker. This government in Washington cannot fix itself. Again, a chunk could be taken out of it here or there. How many people that you listen to or listen to today on radio and TV. How many politicians who you view as your North Star? How many of them on TV or elsewhere today mention Convention of States? None of them. Maybe they're as unserious as everybody else. It's not like they don't know about it. Andy Biggs of Arizona wrote a book against it and obstructed it while he was the Senate president in Arizona. And when he left, as soon as he left, it flew right through the Senate and the House and was signed by the governor. Excuse me, it was signed by the governor. It went through the Senate and the House. Right here. Right here. One of the things that I've been pushing for through this Convention of States. And it's not like this is new. We've been talking about this for a long, long time. This book, The Liberty Amendments, is is, uh, 10 years old. Spending, Section 1, Congress shall adopt a preliminary fiscal budget no later than the first Monday in May for the following fiscal year and submit said budget to the President for consideration. They're always late, so it needs to be in the Constitution. Section 2. Shall Congress fail to adopt a final fiscal year budget prior to the start of each fiscal year 
which shall commence on October 1st of each year, and shall the president fail to sign said budget into law, an automatic, across the board, 5% reduction in expenditures from the prior year's budget shall be imposed for the fiscal year in which the budget has not been adopted. Do you think Congress would adopt this? Of course not. Section 3. Total outlays of the United States government for any fiscal year shall not exceed its receipts for that fiscal year. Section 4. And by the way, that's how most states have to operate. Total outlays of the United States government for each fiscal year shall not exceed 17.5% of the nation's gross domestic product for the previous calendar year. Section 5. Total receipts shall include all receipts of the United States government, but shall not include those derived from borrowing. Total outlays should include all outlays of the United States government, except those for the repayment of the debt principle. In other words, we want to get it paid down. Section 6. Congress may provide for a one-year suspension of one or more of the preceding sections in this article by a three-fifths vote of both houses of Congress, provided the vote is conducted by roll call and sets forth the specific excess of outlays over receipts or outlays over 17.5% of the nation's gross domestic product. Now, why do I provide that provision? Because if we go to war, if we're attacked... We'll need to spend more money than we normally do. But you need three-fifths of both houses for a one-year suspension. Section 7, the limit on the debt of the United States held by the public shall not be increased unless three-fifths of both houses of Congress shall provide for such an increase by roll call vote. Section 8, this amendment shall take effect in the fourth fiscal year after its ratification so they can ramp up for it. But you see, the rules haven't changed, ladies and gentlemen, and a small majority in the House can have a big impact, but it cannot have a big enough impact. So the senators and congressmen, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this, okay? Great. Let's see if you're really prepared to help us do what really needs to be done. I have to go back and check. I think 17 state legislatures have already signed on to Convention of States with virtually no public support, with virtually no public campaign. Could be 18, maybe 19. We need 34. And I guarantee if we got to 20, we'd get the public's attention. Excuse me, we'd get the Congress's attention. But it also included in this amendment taxing authority. Congress shall not collect more than 15% of a person's annual income from whatever source derived. Person shall include natural and legal persons. By the way, again, Congress would never do this. Look at it this way. We'd be doing it to Congress. Section 2, the deadline for filing federal income tax returns shall be the day before the date set for elections to federal office. Why? Why? Because you pay your taxes and you vote the next day. That's why. Might change your attitude. Not yours, you know what I mean. Section 3, Congress shall not collect taxes on a decedent's estate. No more of this double taxation stuff. Section 4, Congress shall not institute a value-added tax or national sales tax or any other tax in kind or form. The point here is, if you don't do that, then they'll say, okay, fine, we won't raise the income tax, but we'll create new taxes. You say, no, you won't. Section 5, this amendment shall take effect in the fourth fiscal year after its ratification. So this is what is proposed. We have 17, 18, or 19 state legislatures who want a 
Convention of States, the second way of amending the Constitution. We need 34, 38 to ratify. And I want to know. That's pretty tough language there. I want to know how many of these 27, so far 27, we're going to vote no because they're fiscal conservatives, you know. I'm going to want to know how many of them not just endorse this, this constitutional effort under Article 5. This is exactly what George Mason had in mind. But I want to know if anybody's lifted a finger to help it, and that's why I want to get Meckler on here perhaps tomorrow and ask him. Because that's what you should be asking all of them. And I happen to know some of them are among the toughest talkers. Oppose it. Oppose it. So I I think there's a lot of people who could be held to account. Most of all, Biden and the Democrats. Most of all, Republicans that have gone along with the spending all these decades. The McConnellites. No question about that. I do not bear any animosity toward people who are trying to do the right thing and take the ball as far as they can because of the circumstances of which this government operates now and the way it's set up is almost mind-numbing. And I do support those who speak out and want to continue to speak out against a nation that is spiraling toward financial disaster. You know, it's like Clarence Thomas, we've talked about, and Antonin Scalia. Not perfect analogy, but good enough. They would come at the Constitution pretty much from the same perspective. Not 100%, but pretty much. And sometimes they would have a different outcome. One would vote one way and one would vote another. That doesn't mean you hate Scalia or hate Clarence Thomas. You disagree with one or the other. Maybe you disagree with both. Maybe you agree with both. I don't know. And so I think that's the situation that exists today. And every one of those 20 know damn well that we should fight, that we should get the best we can, that we should do the best we can, but in the end, it's going to take a convention of states. I'm not the only one who's come to that conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. Many, many others have. You know who came to that conclusion early on? Milton Friedman. I didn't even realize it until I went back and I read Free to Choose. I got all the way to the back and he says, there's one way that we can control this, that, and the other. He said Article 5. Article 5. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. (laughs) 
You know, I sit here and I write a little scribble notes to myself. Just think back to the Reagan days. Reagan had to build up the United States military after Carter. He needed to beat the Soviet Union. He needed to breathe life back into the economy with the greatest tax cuts in American history. And for his time in office, can't really compare it to the numbers today, which are astronomical. Reagan was unable to cut the debt. In fact, he added to the debt. He's still, in my view, the number three greatest president in American history for everything he did. But why do I mention this now? For two reasons. If Reagan couldn't get it done, what makes you think McCarthy can? I think they can do better, which is my point. But doing better isn't even good enough. And people are frustrated. You're frustrated. A lot of people are frustrated. So I want you to try and join us with Convention of States. And number two, the reason I endorse Convention of States after studying it and reading it all this time is I realized if Reagan couldn't significantly cut the debt, it's going to be difficult for anybody to do it because he was enormously popular. He won 59% of the vote in 1984. No Republicans going to do that again. And he won more electoral college votes than any president in American history. And he still couldn't cut the debt because the system in Washington is corrupt. It is institutionally and fundamentally built to do the opposite of what should be done. And how come Mitch McConnell escapes criticism? It amazes me. You got these guys in the House breaking their backs. In the Senate, they just sit there. I mean, Mike Lee got 43 of his colleagues in the Senate to agree to what was proposed by the House. And yet Mike Lee isn't the leader of the Republicans over there. Where is the leader of the Republicans? Where's the number two, the number three, the number four, the number five? This, too, is a huge problem. They don't go into there to see Biden as united leaders. As united leaders. And indeed, the Democrats see that, too. All right, I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877 some of you may not have been hearing the back and forth. You work for a living within the Republican Party. So I want to give you a chance to hear what McCarthy had to say and a chance to hear what Chip Roy had to say. First, McCarthy, cut to go. Right, because at this point, you guys only control, Republicans only control one half of one branch of government. <laughs> so for you to get what you got was great for the most part because, you know, the Republicans did much better in this than the Democrats did, obviously. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and to your point, uh, Joe Biden sounds never like, wanted to uh, negotiate. That's Ducey, you, that's not McCarthy. Go ahead. Because there are going to be, you know, a bunch of Republicans on the big vote are going to vote no. You're going to need a bunch of Democrats to say, you know what? I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm going to vote with Kevin McCarthy. 
Well, normally when you make a, when, when you come to an agreement with two different parties, you have people on both parties vote for it. But the difficulty that's different than any time before is the Democrats will tell you there's nothing in the bill for them. Nothing. The president numerous times, he kept asking for tax increases, new government programs, and I just said no. And he says, well, there's nothing in it for us to vote for. I said, well, there's debt ceiling increase we can go forward on. I'm not sure people want to go past that deadline and interest rates go up and others. Right. I think this is a good first step, but we can go much further. And I have a plan for that coming forward where we can look at the entire budget and tackle our problems, especially in a bipartisan way. This is reasonable. This is sensible. But it's also a responsible thing to do. You know, he's among the most rep- popular Republicans in the country. And there's at least one kamikaze who's talking about making a motion to remove him as speaker. So, I don't follow the kamikazes. And again, when we talk to Mark Meckler, he'll be here tomorrow. I want to know how many of these kamikazes have supported Convention of States in a activist kind of way. I don't necessarily disagree with those who are opposed to this. But you can see where the guy's coming from and you see all the things that he's tried to do and you can see he's trying to do things that Reagan didn't do and Trump didn't do and certainly Bush didn't do and he's Speaker of the House with a handful of majority votes. So, cut three, go. Well, look, uh, it's a different Congress. It's a new day. It's not that you have to pass a bill to find out what's in it. you got 72 hours. This isn't a thousand page bill. This is 99 pages. And this is different than we've ever had before. We're actually going to spend less money this year than we spent last year. And your viewers have heard me give this analogy before. A debt limit is like the family having a credit card, but you've been charging it up every year and just keep lifting the limit. This year's different. We now say we're going to spend less. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to look at all what we spend our money on because the mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, that's all off to the side. So I can only look at about 15% of what we spend our money on. So what we did is, in elements like non-defense, that's going to go below 2022 levels. So that's a very positive. But the other thing we did, we put ourselves on a spending plan. We cap how much we can spend for the next six years with government. But we also did some I get that, but they cannot control the out years. One Congress can't control what's going to happen in the out years. So, for example, if the Democrats take over the House, they're not going to honor that. I just want to make that clear. Go ahead. Different. In this family, we may have a child that uh, able-bodied, not married, no kids, but he's sitting on the couch collecting welfare. We're going to put work requirements on that individual, so he's going to have work requirements. He's going to get a job, and it's going to make the life easier. But we're also going to look at places we've been spending our money that we've wasted that we're going to return, right? Like all that COVID money that we didn't spend, we're going to bring it back. But one of my favorites here is $400 million for CDC, the Global Fund, where we'd use that hardworking taxpayer money over to China. We're not going to do that. We're going to send that back. And then we did a number of other things here, right? One of the things that's very interesting we did, that the president has been spending money wildly. If he wants to put a new regulation in, we took a executive order of President Trump's and now we're putting it into law and making it a little tougher. Where if he wants to put a new regulation in, he has to cut government if it costs more than $100 million. And then we looked at things about cutting the red tape, that we get so frustrated that we can't build the roads. It takes seven years. We now reform NEPA, the Environmental Review. Instead of waiting seven years, now the studies are only one to two years. This hasn't been done in 40 years. And then we did something interesting to make government or make Congress consequences for their lack of action. They have 12 appropriation bills that they have to pass every year, and they never do, and they come back with that omnibus. Now we say, if you don't do your job, it's a 1% cut across the board. So encourage members of Congress, not now with the new Congress, you actually show up, you're now you're going to have to work. This is going to be the biggest cut by the Congressional Budget Office says in history of where we're going forward. To do all that, we allowed the debt ceiling to go forward for the next 18 months and we'll readdress it, hopefully with a Republican president, a Republican Senate, to even make it stronger. Mm-hmm. Now the rebuttal. Here's Chip Roy 
at a press conference today. Cut for a go. My colleagues, be very clear. Not one Republican should vote for this deal. It is a bad deal. No one sent us here to borrow an additional $4 trillion to get absolutely nothing in return. But at best, if I'm being really generous, a spending freeze for a couple of years. That's it. That's about what you get. And frankly, you're going to make things worse. And my Democratic colleagues know it. That's why they're supporting it. Mm-hmm. Well, That's a lot why. of them are not supporting it, actually. But go ahead. Around gleeful. Look, there's a reason our Democrat colleagues support this. There's a reason that Mitt Romney supports this. There's a reason that Bill Crystal supports this. It's all the same stuff. There's a reason also, I guess, Newt Gingrich. Steve Moore. I mean, that's why I said at the opening of the show, don't get caught up in who supports and who opposes. Use your own brain, your own noggin. Analyze it yourself. I get texts and emails. Did you know this? You ought to think that. Nothing's more annoying. I said, I'll wait till it comes out. Go ahead. There's a reason that our conservative allies are opposing it roundly. The Club for Growth scoring against it. The Heritage Foundation scoring against it. Freedom Works scoring against it. Ron DeSantis publicly opposed. President Trump said he thought we should default rather than pursue this kind of lunacy. At the end of the day, the only yeah, person but, that would you default... Know, in all due respect, that's not what he did during his presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just being extremely honest with you. And if I'm not, nobody else will be. Go ahead. Is Joe Biden, unless Republicans default on the American dream by voting for this bad bill. That is why this group will oppose it. We will continue to fight it today, tomorrow, and no matter what happens, there's going to be a reckoning about what just occurred unless we stop this bill by tomorrow. There's going to be a reckoning either way. You know what's amazing, America? Even if Chip gets his way 100%, it's not going to save us. That's how far along we are here. That's how bad this is. It's not going to save us. Cut five, go. There are two paths here. Take up the bill that we passed. It's a good bill. It's sitting over in the Senate. They could pass it in the Senate of the President. Second, Speaker McCarthy should pull this bad bill down. We should stop taking this bill up right now. I don't think he even has a majority of his own conference at this point. We'll find out later today. He should pull this bill down, and then we should do exactly what we're doing right now. We have COVID rescissions right now. COVID rescissions are in the bill. COVID rescissions of $29 billion. They've already taken that in this bill, and they've swept $22 billion and just set it over to the Department of Commerce to spend. for play money. To spend. Take that money. Take IRS money. And go tell Janet Yellen, you're going to pay every bill you need to pay, and we're going to sit down at the table and do the job for the American people. But don't tell me you're going to put me over a barrel for $4 trillion because you refuse to do your job. That is what Speaker McCarthy should have told the President of the United States. Well, there you go. Now, what about the Democrats? Jim Clyburn, he's a party man. Cut six, go. I know you've said that you will vote for the compromise debt bill negotiated between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy. Tell us why. Well, thank you very much for having me, Wolf. Simply because I recognize that there are a lot of things at play here. Number one, the full faith and credit of the United States of America is at stake, and we've got to keep that protected. Number two, we are governing. And when you have two parties, as I've said before, 51% of the House is under Republican control. 51% of the Senate is under Democratic control. That means that we've got to find compromise. And I think that we've found a very good compromise. I spoke throughout this process with the president and with Shalanda Young. I've never met anyone in government more competent uh, for her work or more compassionate 
for her cause. Well, you need to get out a little bit more there, Clyburn, then you will. Go ahead. And I think that when I saw her uh, giving a big thumbs up uh, on this deal, I felt that it was uh, incumbent upon me to do what I can to uh, help get it across. But Jim Hines, Democrat Connecticut, he doesn't see things that way. Cut seven, go. Hakeem Jeffries said to him that their Democrats are mad because there's nothing for them in this bill. What do you make of it? Yeah, that's right, Shannon. I mean, I think there's there's two problems with the bill. Number one is, yeah, um, none of the things in the bill are Democratic priorities. You you know what those priorities are, because in the last two years when we controlled the House, we capped insulin at thirty five dollars for seniors. We did uh, drug price controls. We passed the biggest uh, infrastructure investment in our country ever. We addressed climate change. Those are our priorities and not a single one of them are in this bill. Now, that's not a surprise, given that we're now in the minority. Um, but the the obvious point here and the speaker didn't say this. Um, the reason it may have some traction with some Democrats is that it's a very small bill. It's a very, very small bill. Now, um, you know, had the bill looked anything like what the Republicans passed on the floor, where they rescinded all of the money ad- designed to create an electric battery industry in this country, designed to uh, further reduce drug prices, uh, you would have had unanimity against it. But, um, you know, the IRS money is a pretty good example. Why the Speaker, by the way, wants to defend taking IRS police off the block so that more people can uh, t- you can cheat on their taxes is beyond me. You know, a hole. People don't want to be harassed by their government, but you guys are all in on the police state. But that's another story. Go ahead. The numbers, right? Yeah, you know, eighty billion dollars sent in that direction over a period of time. A very, very small fraction of that has been uh, rescinded. So again, not a bill that's going to make any Democrats happy, but it's a small enough bill that, in the service of actually not destroying the economy this week, may get Democratic votes. There you are. It's all over the map. And that's why you got to look at these things for yourself. And that's why I think they should take a little bit more time and go back. The country's not going to default. Unless Biden wants it to default. But if anything's been demonstrated through this process, at a minimum, he doesn't. And... um, What Biden was hoping originally was that the Republicans would fold. The McCarthy couldn't get a majority together even to make the proposals that they did and that they passed it in the House. That's not what happened, obviously. And then finally, he puts his team together to negotiate at the 11th hour. Now, it's true that the Democrats don't call anything victory that doesn't massively increase spending, massively increase the central government, and just continue to push, push, push. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. Their trajectory that we're on as a result of the way the institutions of government have been bastardized are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to change. Because, as I've said many times, in many ways, we live in a post-constitutional America. You know, one of the people who texts me most, and I won't tell you who it is, is a absolute rock-solid conservative. And we're dear, dear friends. And I get these texts all the time. This guy won't do this, this guy won't do that, this place is broken, this is this, this is that. I agree with him. And yet this dear friend of mine does not support Convention of States. So I think to myself, well, how the hell are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get out of this? See, the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, let's say we win the next election and the one after that and the one after that. Nothing will stop the Democrats from going right back to this. Nothing. Not even if Brother Chip were the Speaker of the House. Nothing will stop them. Unless they are fundamentally stopped as best as we can in the Constitution itself. And even then, they may not adhere to it. 
But if that happens, it's all over anyway. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan. With Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. The head of the Communist Chinese military has refused to meet with Secretary Austin, Secretary of Defense. Do you want to know why? Because they're planning for war. I don't know how many more ways they can show us. And yet, nobody's talking about the defense budget here. We've got a lot of libertarians or maybe national cons, I'm not sure what, who seem to think something's wrong with defending our nation, that we need to wait until we're actually attacked, or a country they might prefer is actually attacked. And of course, that will result in enormous carnage of Americans. So the communist Chinese are on the move and the Biden increase in defense, which is 3%, is pretty much all there's going to be. So one of these fellows who called me, good guy, one of these fellows who called me and said, look, I don't mind raising defense if we take it out of domestic spending. I said, but the Democrats aren't going to go along with that, and the communist Chinese don't give a damn how we do it. So that concerns me, because this is the number one obligation of government. And folks, you don't have to be an interventionist or support forever wars or whatever to want to make sure you protect the United States from its enemy. I'll be right back. Remember the last time you got a quote unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. He's driving the media mad. Mark Levin, call in with your outrage. 877-381-3811. DeSantis is making his formal announcement in Iowa, so we want to dig into that and listen a little bit. Go ahead. Joe Biden back to his basement in Delaware. I mean, he spends so much of his time as president on vacation, we might as well make it permanent. Now, it is great to be back. Now, a few weeks ago, we were in state 
Uh, we were not actually scheduled to come to the Des Moines area, but before we uh, decamped back to Florida, the weather was so nice that we felt we just had to come back and pay everyone a little bit of a visit. We appreciated that. I want to thank Pastor Newman for hosting us here at Eternity Church. Thank you so much. And thanks to your governor, Kim Reynolds, and all the legislators in Iowa who've worked to support her agenda. They've done incredible work in safeguarding freedom in Iowa. And Tim, uh, Kim mentioned, you know, that they, they get a lot done, really bold. People have said that Iowa is the Florida of the North, but I'll tell you, it very well may be that Florida is the Iowa of the Southeast. <laughs> Iowa setting the standard. You all should be proud about what they're doing. Now, I wish the elites in Washington, D.C. would take a page out of the Iowa playbook, but instead they have ignored what works and they've continued to plunge this nation into the abyss. Our country is going in the wrong direction. We can see it and we can feel it. Our southern border has collapsed. The Mexican drug cartels have more control over what goes on at the border than our own United States government. Millions of illegal aliens have poured into this country, including criminal aliens and even individuals on the terrorist watch list. The massive amounts of fentanyl that the cartels are bringing in has killed tens of thousands of our fellow Americans. Look at the economy. The Biden administration is doing all it can to make it harder for the average family to make ends meet and to attain and maintain a middle class lifestyle. Mark Levin the bill show, for yep. the massive borrowing, spending and debt and record printing of money by the Fed, that's falling on the American people. Our dollar has lost almost 20 percent of its value in the last four years. Look at energy. You would think that with these economic problems with inflation, you may want to tap into more domestic energy. But no, Biden is deliberately trying to kneecap our energy production, and he's trying to force Americans into electric vehicles, which will make us more reliant on China, who provides most of the materials for the batteries. We have a bureaucracy that our founding fathers would find unrecognizable. It is an unaccountable, weaponized administrative state that unevenly wields authority depending on its targets. Two different sets of rules depending on whether you're a member in good standing of elite society or not. If Hunter were a Republican, he would have been in jail years ago. Ron DeSantis in Iowa. Is that it, Mr. Producer? And hollowed out by spiking crime due to weak, ideologically driven policies that intentionally allow criminals to roam the streets. We've also witnessed the steady advance of a new form of leftism that has infected institutions across our nation. This form of cultural Marxism sows divisions in our society and devalues merit and achievement. This woke ideology represents a war on truth itself. We have just endured years of attempts to impose medical authoritarianism on our country, including President Biden's attempt to deny Americans the right to put food on the table and earn a living if they decline to take an mRNA COVID shot. The lockdowns and the mandates have done incalculable damage to our country, and the effects are still with us to this very day. And as we commemorated Memorial Day yesterday, we are especially mindful of the 13 service members who lost their lives in Afghanistan due to Joe Biden's dereliction of duty. These failed policies result from elites in the political class who ignore the concerns of the American people and who put their interest above our nation's interest. How is it that five of the seven wealthiest counties in the United States of America 
are suburbs of Washington, D.C. D.C. doesn't produce much of anything besides mountains of debt and loads of hot air. <laughs> These elites are not enacting an agenda to represent us. They are imposing their agenda on us via the federal government, via corporate America, and via our own education system, all for their benefit and all to our detriment. But it does not have to be this way. American decline is not inevitable. It is a choice. And we must choose a new direction for our country. We must choose a path that will lead to a revival of American greatness. We must... We must restore sanity to our nation. We need fiscal and economic sanity. Stop pricing hardworking Americans out of a good standard of living through inflationary borrow, print, and spend policies. Embrace American-produced energy so we can be completely energy independent. We now see Washington is now cooked up their latest, quote, debt deal. And I can tell you this, our nation was careening towards bankruptcy before the debt deal, and it will still be careening towards bankruptcy after this debt deal. This is greenlighting $4 trillion in new debt in less than two years. It took us almost 200 years to get to $4 trillion in debt in the first place. It locks in inflated COVID level, uh, uh, era levels of spending, and it keeps 98% of the 87,000 new IRS agents that Joe Biden instituted. This is not gonna solve our nation's fiscal problems. I can tell you in Florida, we run budget surpluses. We have a 1.2, trillion dollar GDP in Florida. We'd be the 13th largest economy in the world if we were our separate country, and yet with 1.2 trillion economy, our state debt is only $17 billion, second lowest per capita state debt uh, anywhere in these United States. And so it can be done. You just have to be willing to make choices and stop passing the buck to subsequent generations to clean up your mess. Now, restoring sanity means we can't have every major institution in our country going on ideological joy rides. We have to be guided by reality, by facts, and by our enduring principles. Merit must trump identity politics. And no American should have to compete in the woke Olympics just to get a job or just to get into school. We also must return normalcy to our communities. We are a sovereign country and our borders must be respected. We cannot have foreigners pouring into our country illegally by the millions, and we cannot allow drug cartels to poison our population with fentanyl. Law and order must be maintained. I have to take a short break, folks. I will tell you this. So far, it's a fantastic speech. But I like our guys. I don't like their guys. There is a big difference, you know. Totalitarianism is becoming more obvious as the corruption of the, by the Marxists continue to be brought to light. Biden family thinks that they're above the law. So does Christopher Ray, as a matter of fact. And the House is going to vote to hold him in contempt at the direction of the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. More on that later. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. 
Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with mobile hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. All right, we're going to pick up DeSantis in Iowa. Go. Any luck? Here we go. Say. We also must reestablish integrity in our institutions, and that includes our military. Uh, I'm a Navy veteran. I'm proud to have served. <laughs> proud to have done a tour in Iraq, and it was something that uh, I had a lot of opportunities. You know, I was a blue-collar kid growing up. Uh, you know, my mom was a nurse. My father uh, worked for uh, Nielsen Television Ratings, where they put the TV boxes on the Nielsen families back in the day. Uh, I was given nothing. I had to earn uh, what I got. Uh, I, may, I worked minimum wage jobs just to get through school. Uh, but I was able to put myself in a position to have a lot of opportunities. I could have made a lot of money, uh, but this was after 9-11. Uh, I felt that people should serve, and so I volunteered to do that. And, um, you know, you look back at, at the uh, loss of potential income, but wearing the cloth of your country and serving uh, in an honorable institution, that's worth more than anything money can buy. And, <laughs> I know so many people feel that way throughout the years, and it pains me when we see revered institutions like our very own military become more concerned with matters that are not central to the mission, whether it's global warming or gender ideology or pronouns. Morale is declining and recruiting is suffering. We need to eliminate these distractions and we need to get focused on the core mission at hand. We also can't have true constitutional government if the most important issues in our society are decided not by our elected representatives, by, but by some nameless, faceless bureaucrat working in Washington, D.C. Reestablishing integrity to our institutions means we must reinvigorate our constitutional system by returning the government to its rightful owners, we the people. There should be no social or economic transformation without representation. We must reassert truth as the foundation of our society. Common sense can no longer be an uncommon virtue in our society. And I'll tell you, in Florida, we prove that all of this can be done. We chose facts over fear. We chose education over indoctrination. We chose law and order over rioting and disorder. We in the state of Florida held the line when freedom hung in the balance. We refuse to allow our state to descend into some type of dystopia where people's livelihoods were destroyed and their freedoms were curtailed. No, we protected people's rights, and like Governor Kim Reynolds, we ensured our kids had the right to be in school in person. This is DeSantis in Iowa making his really his announcement speech. 
In Florida, we chose freedom over Fauciism, and we are better for doing that. Now, we can look back at that and say, well, of course, wouldn't you want to do that? But at the time, we faced relentless opposition. We faced opposition from media, from the left, from bureaucrats, even from some of our fellow Republicans. People told me, Governor, what you're doing, you're cutting against the grain, you're getting hammered, you're not going to be long for this world politically if you keep doing what you're doing. But you know, leadership is about doing what's right, even in the face of to Martha's Vineyard. Little lag, little few hiccups. We have signed legislation prohibiting the use of a central bank digital currency in our state because we represent, we understand what they're trying to do with that. We've also been the first state to eliminate DEI from our universities in Florida. They say it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the way it's practiced, it's ideology being imposed on all these institutions. The way it's practiced, DEI better stands for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination, and that has no place in our public university system. We have taken action to ensure that Florida runs the most efficient and transparent elections anywhere in the country. We All have right. banned I think we're in good shape, Mr. Producer. Um, and uh, the speech goes on. And it sounds terrific. By the way, you know what's going on in the California Senate, ladies and gentlemen? The California Senate. They're voting on a bill to expedite transmission projects to modernize the electricity grid. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's about 20 years behind. He's attacking the electrical grid. One of the things that is in this this deal that they struck is really going to be helpful for the uh, creation more or the access to more energy. Uh, because it does blow out an awful lot of the red tape that's involved in getting leases and drilling. So uh, that is a very positive thing. We'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811. 7381-3811. I sound a little funny. You ever bite your tongue? It's weird, isn't it? It's like all of a sudden your mouth broke. Well, I bit my tongue so hard today that it kept bleeding. And so I'm trying to speak as best I can. I almost went in for a stitch, believe it or not, but somehow it stopped. I tell you folks everything, don't I? I've got more to tell you later this week, too. Now, you heard a lot of what Ron DeSantis had to say today in Iowa. He said, sounded pretty good. Dave Jolly is a one-term Republican congressman from Florida. I think he's left his party. I know he used to work on Capitol Hill. And he's a left-wing kook, which is why he's at MSNBC. That's part of the resume requirement. And uh, he's on there, and he says something that I warned you would happen. See, if they get Trump out of the way, and DeSantis moves up, they're going to try and take DeSantis out of the way. They want somebody like a Chris Sununu, or Chris Christie, in other words, somebody who none of you want. And then, of course, they'll attack them, too, the way they attacked Romney and McCain and the other rhinos. But here he is, hat-tip newsbusters on MSLSD, cut 12, go. 
You and I have talked uh, a great deal about DeSantis' authoritarianism in Florida. Nevertheless, yeah. were you yeah, let's, shocked? Let's, 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 let's just stop a second. This is really precious coming from these Democrats. Joe Biden just said the other day that he had the power to unilaterally raise the debt ceiling, which would be the biggest grab of power in American history by one branch against another. Ever. Go ahead. From this week, that he would, quote, aggressively go after pardons for one six insurrectionists. No, Mehdi, I say this with conviction. I think Ron DeSantis is far more dangerous than Donald Trump for there a very go. specific reason. Donald Trump is willing to ignore the rules, ignore the Constitution. And Donald frankly, Trump, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Donald Trump never ignored the Constitution. Name once. Never ignored the Constitution. You must have him confused with Biden. You moron. You know, there's nothing worse than a Republican who's gone to the other side. Now, there's bad Republicans. Please don't get me wrong. I mean, the establishment Republicans hate nobody more than moi. Me, I can't go to these Capitol Hill parties. Not that I would. I wouldn't. But I can't. And I don't. Some talk show hosts love that stuff. Some TV hosts love I can't stand it anyway. But it's like somebody who's, you know, been a smoker and now they're not a smoker, something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. They're, they're obsessed. And this guy is obsessed. Go ahead. I meant of January 6th. But Donald Trump is a transactional figure. He'll do whatever it takes to win. Ron DeSantis, I believe, actually in his ethos, is a culture warrior who wants to take us back 100 years and believes he can use the Constitution. Okay, to that. that's enough. Take us back 100 years. Mr. Jolly is not so jolly. I guess Mr. Jolly doesn't mind if his kids or grandkids, assuming as either, are taught about removing their genitalia or replacing their genitalia or sexuality or looking at pornographic books when they're seven years old. That tells us where Mr. Jolly's mind is, as well as what's this other? Medi. Who oh, Medi? Over on MS. Was this the same guy yet again who I crush in the ratings every Sunday? Yes, it is. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Very amazing, as a matter of fact. In fact, I want to tell you about the Blaze TV. You know, there are, there are groups like this mediocreite, mediaite, very upset with my interview with Trump. So upset that some guy named Colby, I think it's a guy, could be a gal, I have no idea. Uh, not once, but twice, he was very upset. He took to the Pages, if you will, of Mediaite, which is founded by Dan Abrams. You can't miss him. He's the guy that, that has a squirrel glued to his head. And uh, very upset about the way I interviewed Trump. Now, they are a little slow in the uptake there. Of course, they suck up to Joe Scarborough. They suck up to Biden. They suck up to all the usual rat finks and, and uh, reprobates. My goal in interviewing Trump was to let him speak, not to interrupt him and not speak for him, so that people could hear what he had to say, not what I had to say. And that's how I do my interviews, which is why we're number one on Sunday night. Usually we're number one on Sunday and Saturday night. Often we're number one on the whole weekend. So you keep doing what you're doing, mediocre, right? in your dusty mom's basements, and I'll do what I do, which is interview people for the purpose of actually letting them speak. There was a time when I was growing up that that was a good thing. That's what we did. But today, no. But the real suck-ups are over there in Meteorite. And then there's another site, the Daily Bestiality. Have you ever seen that site, Mr. Producer? 
Mr. Call Screener, they call themselves the Daily Beast, but I prefer the Daily Beastiality. Then there's the Huffington Compost, and you'll see when the mediocre right guys put something down, they go, hey, hey, but you guys are... And so it travels through the, you know, the sewer of the left. But we do enjoy it. I don't even look at... People send me this stuff. Please stop. Then I go online and whack them a little. I don't really enjoy social media that much. I'll post things. I tend not to stick around, tend not to read comments. Sometimes people send them to me. I'm really not interested. It just happens from time to time. So there was Mr. Jolly. Cut 10, Mr. Producer. This is breaking now. Go. If we, Comer subpoenaed the document that he requested, we have jurisdiction over the FBI, which they seem to act like we do not. I personally called uh, Director Ray and told him he needs to send that document. Today is the deadline. So let me not just tell you, let me tell Director Christopher Ray right here, right now. If he misses the deadline today, I am prepared to move contempt charges in Congress against him. We have jurisdiction over this. He can send us that document. We have the right to look Look at that. Republicans and Democrats alike in that committee. And if he does not follow through with the law, we will move contempt charges against Christopher Ray and the FBI. You know Doesn't matter what he says. Uh, the speaker is 100 percent correct. As I've said over and over and over and over again, the FBI is not in the Constitution. Neither is the Department of Justice. They have an absolute right to oversight under separation of powers. It's that simple. And Christopher Ray is a cover-up artist. Don't let that dumb look on his face make you think that, well, he's dumb. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. You know, it's a pleasure to have Greg Jarrett on the program. Why? Because he's smart. He's a good lawyer. He, uh, he understands tyranny when he sees it. He's not afraid to stand up to it. How are you, my friend? Hey, I'm well. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Mark. It's a pleasure. Well, you've written a hell of a book here, The Trial of the Century. What is The Trial of the Century? Which one? <laughs> you know, there have been a lot of famous trials that uh, have been dubbed as such by the media over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Nuremberg case, Julius Ethel Rosenberg, uh, you know, the O.J. Simpson double murder case, which I covered for nine months in Los Angeles. They they pale in comparison to the 1925 Scopes monkey trial mm-hmm. because at stake was our cherished free speech rights. America was at the precipice. Uh, There was an effort, and it was succeeding, to ban books, for example, on evolution, and they weren't going to stop there. They were going to ban a variety of science books and other books. And in the state of Tennessee, they made it a crime for a teacher to teach out of the state-approved textbooks a chapter on the cornerstone Darwin theory of evolution, because they feared it would undermine the story of the divine creation in Genesis and the Bible, which it didn't. They're harmonious. And Clarence Darrow was incensed over it. So when a young 25-year-old school teacher was handcuffed, criminally charged, and thrown in the hooskow, Darrow came to the rescue, the greatest trial lawyer who ever lived, and he, for free, defended John Scopes. It became known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, Mm -hmm. which was uh, derived from an evolutionary misconception that humans evolved from monkeys or other primates. I traveled a couple of years ago to the courthouse in Dayton, Tennessee, where the trial took place. It's closed now, but buried in the archives of the basement and I gained access, was the original trial transcript on which the trial of the century is based. It tells the story about how the courage of a young school teacher and his great acclaimed lawyer Clarence Darrow changed the tide in America that was on the precipice. And, uh, you know, but for their efforts, America might be a very different place today, Mark. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Are you getting any people say, oh, it's just like DeSantis in Florida, which, of course, it's not. No, nobody's made uh, that accusation ready as it. yet. The, the, I am ready for it. The book just <laughs> came out today in bookstores nationwide. People yeah. can order it online. Um, it did get uh, some good reviews. Uh, you know, from uh, Publishers Weekly, uh, good. you know, they said it was colorful and dramatic and, and tells an important story. Uh, Kirkus gave it a starred review, which for, for somebody like me working at Fox News is unheard of. Um, although you may have gotten one for your excellence. Who the hell I don't knows? recall. Let me ask you this. <laughs> you... Take this almost step by step, the major elements, this trial and so forth. And it is intriguing. And you say you got this transcript. Did you get a transcript of the whole trial, or did you have to just go back to the books and break it down and take a look at all of this? I got a complete transcript, the original transcript wow. uh, of the trial. It was printed out every day. Uh, and it was published at the time in 1925 in newspapers around the country and throughout mm -hmm. the world, uh, and people were following it. Um, it was then put together in one volume, and I got my hands on that, as well as the handwritten long-form notes of the judge's court reporter, uh, you know, note taking throughout the trial, and and you know, I used all of that, studied it for months and months. I wrote all the chapters on the trial. My co-author Don Yeager did a lot of the background digging into the history of the town and the characters involved. And we put it all together, and you know, most Americans, I mean, you know, because you know history uh, and the law, but most Americans have never heard of the trial of the century. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, that's the date of my father's birth, 1925. And so what happened? There's, there's this big trial. Tell the people what the jury did. Tell the people what happened after the trial. Well, Darrell realized that he was facing overwhelming odds. And he was standing alone to take on popular opinion. You know, banning books on evolution and criminalizing the teaching of it was, was quite popular across America. A bunch of states passed these laws. So there he is, you know, not in home field advantage. The courtroom was packed with supporters of the great fundamentalist leader, William Jennings Bryan, who was so happy that he got the law passed, he volunteered to be the prosecutor uh, to convict Scopes. And the jury was composed of devoted church members. I, I don't begrudge that at all. I go to church. I'm very devout. Um, only one of them knew anything about evolution. Three had read no other book except the Bible. The presiding judge was an ordained minister. He'd been critical of evolution. And his rulings from the bench consistently favored the prosecution. At one point when Darrow uh, raised questions of fairness, he was held in criminal contempt of court. And the judge prevented Darrell from putting on a legitimate defense of his choosing. He had assembled at great expense a team of nationally renowned scientists and theologians to explain to the jury how evolution does not undermine the Bible. But the judge would have none of it, refused to allow any of them to testify before the jury, and Darrell then did something extraordinary. It was daring. It was consequential. He called the prosecutor, his nemesis, William Jennings Bryan, to the witness stand as an expert on the Bible, knowing that, that Bryan's ego would never allow him to resist. Sure enough, Bryan took the bait. He stood up and insisted he would testify. Hold your point. Hold your point. We're going to take a hard break. And by the way, you feel like you're there when you read your book. You feel like you're right there in the courtroom. It's a fantastic book, ladies and gentlemen. You can get it at Amazon.com. It came out just today. The Trial of the Century by Greg Jarrett. It's well worth reading. The Trial of the Century by Greg, uh, Greg Jarrett. And we'll be right back. Mark Levin. 
the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. The Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925. Trial of the Century, that's the book. Greg Jarrett, you know him from Fox. He's a terrific lawyer. And you know what's good about you, Greg, is you take your time, you walk people through so they understand complex issues. You do exactly that with this book. It is absolutely fascinating. And folks, if you're not clear on what happened in this trial, even though you're hearing Greg and and me talk about it, you really need to read it. And you can get it at Amazon.com, any of my social sites, The Trial of the Century, Greg Jarrett. All right. So tell us about this confrontation. There it is, the big confrontation. The climactic moment of the trial, Darrow appears to have lost because the deck is stacked against him. He's in the lion's den, if you will. And he calls the prosecutor, William Jennings Bryan, the epic, legendary fundamentalist leader, to the witness stand. And the judge was fearful the second room courtroom might collapse. Uh, so he moves it outdoors to a platform left over from July 4th festivities. So there they are, Daryl, face to face. I've got a photograph in the book, 38 photographs, but one of them is Daryl face to face with Brian. And he challenges Brian's interpretation that everything in the Bible should be accepted literally as written. And of course, we know, and theologians know, and even the Pope knows that there are passages in the Bible that are parables. They're allegory. They teach us important moral lessons, but they're spiritual, not literal. So thousands of people are looking on. You can see the picture of it. Darrow's cross-examination was bold. It was mesmerizing. Uh, He dismantled the veneer of Brian's strident beliefs. And, you know, the more Brian fumbled trying to answer these tough questions, uh, the more sentiment in the crowd that loved Brian began to shift, derisive laughter from the crowd that only inflamed Brian's panic. And he destroyed his nemesis. He was thoroughly discredited. Brian had clung to a righteousness that he mistakenly ascribed to virtue, and he he tried to force his religious ideology on others by enacting this misbegotten law. And he was so broken that he laid down for a nap a couple of days later, still in Dayton, just down the street from the courthouse, and he never woke up. He died. And I've got a picture of his casket, flag drape being loaded onto a Pullman car being taken up to Washington, D.C., people lining the tracks to pay their respects for this great man. And he was a great man, and I admired him. His cross of gold speech at the Democratic Convention in 1896, one of the greatest speeches ever delivered. But it was a sad epitaph for for a once great man that he clung without compromise to something that, you know, theologians and all major religions now concede exists. Evolution uh, presupposes creationism. That's what Pope Francis said. They're not in conflict. They're harmonious. And so Darrell lost the trial, but historians would write that he won it. And, you know, Mark, why did he win it? Because he shifted public opinion. It spelled the beginning of the end for the banning of books. It stood up for the importance of freedom of speech, academic autonomy, intellectual empowerment. It stood for the indispensable proposition that no one should be told how to think. And that is the bottom line from the trial of the century. Now, what do you say to listeners out there? who believe that the Bible is, in fact, the Word. And yet you say that evolution and the Bible, they're not, they're not in conflict. It's a good point. Yeah, and, you know, Darrow's point, and I'm paraphrasing here in his argument before the judge and jury is just as 
people should be allowed to exercise their religion freely. People ought to be able to learn freely. Let them make up their own minds. You know, uh, science and mathematics and uh, history should, should not be subject to a litmus test of the Bible. The Bible cannot and should not be a yardstick for all learning in the world. And that was really the point here. Let people decide for themselves, but, but don't foreclose their ability to learn. You know, evolution, whether you believe it or, or not, is a cornerstone sort of fundamental element of science. And as I say, 98% of theologians agree with Darrow's argument, and indeed the Pope did. Uh, you know, he built on the works of previous popes, Pius the Twelfth and John Paul the Second. And so, you know, I, I Darrow always sought common ground, and I think we today in society can also seek common ground. You know, the Pope said evolution of nature does not contrast with the notion of creation. All right, my friend. That's Greg Jarrett. The book is The Trial of the Century. I know you're going to find it fantastic, absolutely compelling. Now, one last question. Why did you choose this case? I know you think it's The Trial of the Century, and I think you're probably right, but out of all the things you could write on, why this? Well, I was a teenager when I discovered Clarence Darrow and The Trial of the Century. My father had uh, volumes of books on his densely packed bookshelf. And, you know, one summer day, I don't know why I did it, and I explained this in the preface. I plucked that book from the shelf, and I sat down, and I started reading it. I couldn't put it down. I loved books, always have. The more I read it, the more I admired uh, Darrow's passion for the law, his sense of justice, his unyielding commitment to civil liberties and intellectual freedom. And by the time I had finished it, it changed my life. It shaped the contours of the remainder of my life. It inspired me to pursue a legal career. And at the end of this book by the great writer Irving Stone, 1941, you know, he tells the story of the trial of the century, but it's a short chapter. It deserved more. And for the last 55 years, I've wanted to write this book, and I finally did. Mm -hmm. And did a fantastic job. Folks, I encourage you to go to Amazon.com right now. Get a copy of this book. It'll be on your steps tomorrow. That's the trial of the century. Talking to Greg Jarrett. Or any major bookstore should have it as well. Um, but you can get it on Amazon immediately. The Trial of the Century, Amazon.com. We've also linked to it on all of my social sites. Greg, I hope to see you one day soon, my friend. I do, too. Uh, I miss seeing you. And listen, thank you very much for having me on. You've been very kind in your comments about my book. And I do hope people will take the time to read it. I think they will. Take care of yourself. God bless. Thank you. You, too. All right. I think you will like that book a lot. Clarence Darrow was one of the great lawyers of all time. You know, what's interesting is, well, I can't really talk about it until I have the book in front of me. It's a book that's influenced me. And it, I believe it was written by a Christian theologue. No, it was written by a professor who was an atheist for virtually his entire life. And then I believe he was British. Again, I'll have to uh, have to take another look at this because it's been so long. And um, suddenly, maybe not so suddenly, he started to think about it. And then he he reasoned from his perspective, which would be mine, that there is a God. I had a gentleman on, jeez, I can't remember his name, early days of my Fox show, very, very early days. This guy is one of the smartest people I've ever talked to. PhD, professor, writer, part of the Independence Institute. 
chain smoker, as I recall, lives in Paris. He's an American. Eccentric, but very relatable. That is, could have a good conversation with him. And every now and then, he'll email me. No, 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 no. And um, this gentleman, he's, he's an atheist or an agnostic. But he rejects those who say evolution is 100%. And he explains it in great detail. That it's impossible that man came from apes. And he explains why. I'll tell you what, I will dig into the archives and I'll try and find the interview and try and post it tonight. If I can't post it tonight, I'll post it tomorrow. As I said... Social media is not my strong point. I want to tell you about our dear friends at Pure Talk. You know, this is a fantastic sponsor. These are loyal people. These are patriotic people. You know, in the radio business, the vast majority of people are very, very good. Vast majority of owners, program directors, general managers, producers, hosts, and so forth. But every now and then there's one, maybe two, but one, who's a complete ass. Who thinks he owns you? Who thinks he can silence you? Of course, that could never happen here. The GOP is going to hold the FBI director in contempt. They're teeing up the vote. And that's exactly what they should have done. And I don't think it would have been done without McCarthy, quite frankly. He's been very headstrong and stubborn in a good way about pursuing corruption in this administration. Be right back. Mark Lovin. the show goes fast we do need a fourth hour question about it all right mr producer mr call screener let's take a caller throw a uh, curveball at me go ahead give me one barry the great krla 870 the answer in los angeles go yeah in regard to the debt ceiling i think chip roy said it best but my question for chip roy is why the hell wasn't he saying this last week and the week before. The point being... I'm sorry, why, why wasn't was he McCarthy saying what? I didn't hear you. Why was, why was McCarthy negotiating anything? They passed the bill two or three weeks ago. Why did they not make the Senate vote on it? I don't know. Anything with Biden. Why don't you ask why was, McConnell that Biden question? Should, Hold on, pal. You're going too fast. Who runs the Senate? Are, you, are we going to have a conversation or are you going to ramble on? Who runs the Senate? McConnell and Schumer. Paul, why don't you ask him that Maybe. question? Well, why, why, why was McCarthy negotiating? He passed negotiating with job. Biden? I don't know any speaker who hasn't negotiated with a president on the debt ceiling. Can you name one? Oh, now why I gotta was go. McCarthy negotiating? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I apologize. I don't have enough time to give a full answer. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> 